Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so the first talk now is about the lunar gravitation wave detection, or more specifically, lunar gravitation wave antenna, which is the project that we are following, not the only one that has been proposed uh, in the last years. Um, maybe to um, say a little bit about where I am from. So uh, my home institution is Grand Sasso Science Institute, which is uh, in L'Aquila, nearby Rome, and it, is, uh, it was created after the earthquake that happened in 2009, where um, L'Aquila was uh, destroyed heavily by the earthquake, which was a quite strong one. Um, and something that existed in that area already before was the, um, the other national labs of Gran Sasso, which some of you might know for, for neutrino and dark matter experiments underground, deep underground, like a kilometer and more. Um, and so these are, however, a separate structure where we can, uh, as uh, researchers as Gran, at GSSI, also um, have our own experiments, however. Okay, so now first back to the question, um, why do we even want yet another gravitation wave detector? Um, and um, so the, 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 the story at the moment is the following. Um, I showed this to some of you already on, on Monday that uh, with the current, you know, um, detector con uh, detectors that we have, we are um, spanning a wide band of frequencies, like 20 decades. And this goes from the quasi, you know, sta sta uh, static uh, part of the, of the gravitation wave background um, uh, that we can see in the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. The pulsar timing arrays at nano around nanohertz. The space detector LISA will be, uh, you know, at millihertz to tens of millihertz, and then the terrestrial detectors above a few hertz in the future. Currently, rather above 20 hertz, I would say. Um, now that is a lot, and you might wonder, okay, uh, is 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 that enough or not? So the the thing is, of as indicated already in this uh, as, um, plot here that there are gaps. And now the question is, is there science hidden in these gaps? Should we somehow take care of uh, coming up with ideas how to observe gravitation waves in, in these frequencies that are still left open? And um, I don't have the answer for all of these gaps, but certainly we know from past studies that the decihertz band is uh, extremely important to gravitation wave science. And that was initially pointed out uh, in a study that was done by um, that was uh, done by NASA. So NASA asked, uh, was putting together a team of high uh, profile gravitation wave scientists in the, in, the, in the 90s, I think. And they asked to them, what detector do we need to be able to, you know, to be sure almost that we would see a primordial gravitation wave background if it, if it existed. So the, the, the lowest um, predicted uh, level is coming from these slow roll inflationary models. And so if you want to reach that level um, of sensitivity, what detector do you need? And so then a study was made and um, that uh, really led to uh, follow up studies uh, about uh, other science that you could do with that detector. It turned out that for the measurement of the primordial gravitation wave background, if not done uh, at this at these very early times. Um, so such a detector would be in the decihertz band. I, I will not go through the arguments why that is so. You can ask me later in the break why the decihertz band is uh, really the perfect band for these uh, primordial um, gravitation wave studies. But uh, in any case, that was the outcome. And that was giving the name that was given to the detector was Big Bang Observer, and that kicked off a lot of decihertz interest later on. Led also to, to the, the SIGO uh, idea and concept at some point where some of you are involved in. And uh, in any case, uh, we know today that the decihertz band is extremely important. Uh, there's a lot of science in there. And, um, and so the lunar gravitation wave antenna is proposed in that context as well. OK, very briefly, we have seen this. Um, the gravitation, the way the LGWA works is that when a um, gravitation wave passes the moon, then it is uh, introduce, uh, you know, inducing these quadrupolar vibrations. And this is what we want to read out. Fine. Um, now, just as a toy example to illustrate this a little bit, 
So here on the frequency axis, you know, for example, you could imagine, I mean, this is really a toy example, which means there's very, very little physics, almost no physics in this plot, okay? Um, this is just to illustrate a little bit the situation. So the moon, for example, if there's a moon quake, in principle, it could ring up many normal modes uh, of the moon. And they are not all quadrupolar modes. So they're kind of, they're, you know, they can be in, in any kind of uh, angular order in, you know, in principle. Uh, and so you could see them uh, in, in such a normal mode spectrum, for example, after a moonquake in principle. So now some of these modes are quadrupolar modes. And these are the ones that can be excited by gravitational waves as well. Okay. No, because there is uh, the radial, the, you know, they're distinguished in radial order. Yeah, so essentially, when you look along, along the radial direction, you see that there are different uh, number of nodes, and that gives rise to different frequencies there. So, um, so, in th so there's an infinity of these quadrupolar modes that are distinguished by their radial order, essentially. Of course, but every quadrupolar mode also has five submodes, if you think about this. And they can also be, the degeneracy can be broken in principle by rotation or asymmetry uh, in, in, in the from, you know, deviation from the spherical um, symmetry. Um, now, anyway, so that is the, that is the situation. And now these, these you have to pick, you have to uh, not only know the frequency and, 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 um, and uh, quality factor, which essentially means uh, how high that mode is in the spectrum, uh, but um, you also really have to know if you want to calculate the response to gravitation waves, uh, the amplitude profile of that mode with, uh, as a function of the radius um, within the moon. If you have that information because of some model about the internal structure about, uh, of the moon, then you can calculate from this, uh, for example, a, a lunar gravitation wave response model. And that is what um, some do. For example, uh, Josipa Majstorovic, who's now also in Paris, she did this normal mode simulation um, and so here you can see um, per unit strain the, 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 the horizontal displacement that would be produced by a gravitational wave. So uh, here, the, 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 um, this very fast oscillation that's on top of the, the curve here at low frequency has, uh, these are, well, I wouldn't say necessarily artifacts, but this is like an, you know, uh, uh, an outcome of the analysis. It's not really like a, a deep physical reason for, for this fast oscillation. Okay, um, fine. So now um, that idea, as I already mentioned, um, is not really new. So the very first gravitation wave um, observation that was tried was by observing the excitation of the normal modes uh, of the earth. And so there was a group um, around Joe Weber, which, um, um, was collaborating with um, a geophysicist at uh, Caltech. They had the, a very, very sensitive uh, seismic instrument, um, the Benioff strain and seismograph. And so with that data, they were then, and you know, some kind of response model of, of, the, of, of the earth, they were then able to set upper limits on the spectral density of the Riemann tensor of the components, of course, which we all today know to be the strain components. Um, and so, you know, when you multiply this, you, uh, then you get to strain sensitivities of what, 10 to minus 12 or something like that. So it was really not physically interesting, uh, but the first search that was ever done, and that was already in the 60, you know, 61, very early. So, of course, uh, so later on, by the way, I can mention that people tried to do a slightly more sophisticated searches on Earth. So there, were, there was another experiment that it was with a pair of uh, gravimeters, superconducting gravimeters in California, again, where they tried to somehow look at both data that was, you know, the, the gravimeters were separated by 100 kilometers or something like this, or a few hundred kilometers. And so then they were comparing the data and trying to find a way to distinguish between gravitation wave signal and, and seismic background. And so uh, some actually even claimed in a nature paper a detection based on that search, but it was not, of course. <clears throat> but um, in any case, uh, Weber must have understood that, you know, you won't get very far on Earth with that idea. 
but then there was the Apollo era, and then there was uh, eventually Apollo 17, and uh, this instrument was, uh, was deployed on the moon in 72. Uh, and then, uh, <clears throat> however, it didn't really work. Um, not, you know, the data was not completely useless. I mean, um, Tashi uh, knows this best, but uh, it was, uh, you know, the, the, the performance was not as it, as it should be. Um, there, there was very little science coming out of that instrument. Okay. So then um, we, um, I mean, somehow I don't actually remember, but I, uh, I learned about this idea and then I start, you know, started uh, to, uh, you know, um, look at seismic data from around the world to see if we now do, because it was clear, the first searches that were done were very primitive in terms of the search algorithms that were applied uh, to, to the seismic data. And so what we thought is, okay, we now have the LIGO pipelines uh, for stochastic signals and all of that, which are really very uh, good also at distinguishing between um, other noise transients that come from the environment maybe, uh, or from the instrument and, uh, and gravitational wave signals. And so we thought like, okay, let's modify them and uh, to make them applicable to a, to a network of, uh, of, of seismic sensors. And so then uh, what we did was uh, handpicking um, seismometers. So there are thousands of seismometers with, with public data. But uh, what we then did is we were looking for pairs of seismometers, antipodal pairs, always with the idea that the seismic signal is uncorrelated mostly, which is not always true. So during strong earthquakes, you will even find some level of correlation, uh, you know, antipodal pairs. But apart from that, the, the seismic uh, signal is uncorrelated. Uh, and um, uh, the gravitation wave signal, however, is perfectly correlated in antipodal pairs, even from stochastic backgrounds. And so that is what we, what we did. And then we had like decades of data from some of these stations. And then we used this kind of idea to set upper limits. Uh, we did this in the decihertz band. We did this uh, at millihertz frequencies. And we also did it by correlating Earth mode data. Because Apollo uh, sen uh, seismometers were, of course, uh, measuring parallel to, you know, to seismometers on Earth in the 70s. Okay. Fine. Um, that led maybe also to kind of interesting uh, upper limits because, uh, you know, with that method, we got like 10 orders of magnitude better than all the lab experiments for the decibels band. So there are the torsion bar and atom interferometer experiments, and they were like 10 orders of magnitude worse than the upper limits that, were, that we were able to set at that time but not yet enough for, for, for gravitational wave detection. Okay, but anyway, um, out of that interest came then the idea in 2020 to respond to the ESA call uh, with, uh, with this concept. I will not really explain detail anymore. You have seen this. Um, we want to deploy in a permanently shadowed uh, region. Powering is, uh, is, is a problem. So, you know, how do you get uh, energy to your experiment? Um, there are possibilities, but some of this is technologically not yet ready at a low readiness level. Some of that is politically difficult at the moment. So we will see, we will see what will happen, but that is really the main challenge for us to, to overcome. Um, now, um, there were three concepts proposed in 2020. Uh, these two, because of the ESA call, and this, this one in the same year independently by, by uh, two Americans. And so uh, maybe at this time, I want to explain a little better this plot here. So um, uh, I did a study in, in the end to just look at the impact of the seismic background on the different types of detectors that you could build on the moon. So without even thinking about what uh, instrument, uh, you know, the details about the instrument noise, just thinking about the seismic background and making, you know, and, and inferring like uh, something about the observation bands. It turns out that the seismic background appears quite differently in the, in the different concepts. And um, it turns out that, um, so the, the, the seismic strain meter would potentially be a very powerful instrument at low frequencies where I can even see because of thermal noise limitations uh, that, that it can overcome LGWA insensitivity. But it turns out that it is very strongly limited by the seismic background. So it cannot penetrate into the decihertz band. That's impossible because you would have to do a background uh, reduction in your data by orders of magnitude, which is just not uh, you know, thinkable. 
to, to, to achieve that. So uh, that, that um, scheme is uh, uh, very interesting, but I would say below a few tens of millihertz. Yeah, it is uh, like LIGO without suspending the optics. So you're just putting the mirrors on the ground. And uh, in terms of gravitational wave response, it's actually the same, it turns out, because, uh, um, well, not at these frequencies, but let's say uh, in this band, it would be the same because I told you about the liquidity of the moon at higher frequency. That means uh, uh, the moon as suspended test masses just freely respond to gravitational wave strain. So the signal in, you know, is the same. If LIGO put their mirrors on the ground, the gravitational wave response would be exactly the same. The only difference is that you have all the seismic noise in your data or not. So that is the difference. That's why you suspend. It's not that you have to do it to get a response to gravitational waves. Um, so now, and then uh, the, this here is actually something like LIGO on the moon with suspended optics. But there you really have in the end a lower bound in frequency because you run into really technical issues with, um, with your seismic isolation. Because for this year, you need uh, good seismic isolation, even on the moon. And so you, uh, we currently cannot think of a seismic isolation system that brings you, I mean, even below a few hertz is already difficult. Uh, bringing it below 0 0.1 hertz is very hard. I mean, we have, I mean, it is a little bit, you know, um, futuristic. Okay, but anyway, then you end up with this picture. So LWA is maybe, uh, in terms of the sensitivity, it can ultimately reach not, uh, you know, not as good as the other two. On the other hand, the Glock one is, you know, currently technology-wise technology and how to install it far, far in the future. And LSGA is really um, uh, uh, constrained to the low frequencies and so not a deciduous detector. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, how it could look like. So for sure, uh, maybe in the long run, that's, that's where we would go on the moon. But at the moment, we have no idea to, to build that thing. Um, now the permanent shadows, I will go quickly over this. Um, as already pointed out, it is, uh, you know, these permanent shadows can be very, very cold. Um, some of them can have temperatures, you know, continuously below uh, 40 or even 30 Kelvin. Uh, there are some... Um, um, yeah, in any case. So there, there's also important for us uh, sunshine illumination near the South Pole, for example, because uh, that might be connected to ideas how you uh, power your system. But of course, uh, sunshine illumination also goes into models that predict surface temperatures and so on and so forth. So this is all a, a study that you will hear later uh, today, I think, uh, from Philip Glaser, uh, which is uh, one of the really um, key issues of, of the mission. Okay, now about the seismic background, also very quickly because we talked about this already. So on Earth, that's how a seismic spectrum looked like, but only if it's like one of the quietest places on Earth. It turns out, so this is here, a series of seismic spectra collected in a histogram, which were measured at Sardinia inside a borehole. So Sardinia, even at the surface, is known to be one of the quietest places in the world. Now in a borehole, it is really, you know, the, the spectra are, are, are very close at, at this part here, to this uh, low noise model, the, the, the global minimum of seismic vibrations. Now, um, here you can see the influence of the, of, of the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, which uh, means that you are kind of, you know, a factor 10 or so above the low noise model. And that is similar in Japan, for example, where you also see the Pacific, you know, the, the, the impact of the Pacific, which uh, moves that, uh, this mode away from the low noise model. So, of course, the closer you are the, of the, to the sea, the stronger is that part of the spectrum because this is all oceanic disturbance. At low frequencies, it depends where you are. At uh, Sardinia, the low frequency noise really comes from the atmosphere, pressure fluctuations in the atmosphere. And, of course, uh, these parts here go away. I don't really know what produces that seismic noise here. I have no idea. It, um, uh, and it's very difficult to analyze it because you need an underground seismometer array to really understand where that noise comes from. And that's, of course, very expensive. We will not have it even at the candidate sites at the moment. So um, we only know about the low frequency stuff. Now, yes. Yes. Yeah, this is ocean waves. Um, exactly. So this is uh, from nearby France or from south of it's, uh, Sicily. There, there are the main fields. And, on the sea where we're producing this noise. So the redder it is, you mean this color? I mean the color of the histogram. 
the, you know, of, the, of the histogram you mean yeah so I mean the, the here the colors just mean how how um, how often you know it you have to think of it of a histogram uh, you could uh, draw it in 3d so that means the histogram is uh, uh, stronger or has higher values uh, on uh, on this mode here so it means you are essentially observing the seismic spectrum to be more often on this red color than on the blue color when you know all these blue uh, spectra here occur very very rarely so most of the time you are observing seismic spectra that are on this uh, curve so now you can compare with the moon and here you see the same line this is the line here that is the same line here so this line uh, uh in, you know now if you look at the apollo spectra they are below that line so and, and actually by you know by two orders of magnitude below that line which means like uh, three orders of magnitude below this uh, uh, sardinia seismic spectrum so that is what we already know from apollo measurements we have three orders of magnitude um, reduction in, in seismic uh, noise and the 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 model lunar background i mean this is uh, really work that we have to do more carefully for us uh, for our purposes but we can expect it to be somewhere between 10 to the minus 14 or a few times 10 to the minus 14. But I think even there's even the possibility that it can be lower because it really depends on how you uh, um, uh, analyze your data and, and you know, and so forth and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is really our opportunity. Orders of magnitude reduction of the seismic background. Uh, I will uh, skip this uh, slide more or less because uh, this is from, uh, you will see uh, now in the next talk by yours, uh, everything about the payload. We have to build a very, very sensitive seismometer to see gravitational waves well beyond what was deployed with the lunar surface gravimeter um, with Apollo 17. Um, and oh, I should mention, well, you will hear this also later, but um, oops, sorry, I was going like so. Okay. There's also a paper uh, that yours wrote uh, with, uh, with a few people about this uh, concept, uh, which describes it quite in detail. Um, this is what we proposed last year as sound check mission. So just to give you some parameters and dimensions, what we expect. So uh, in total, it will be a payload mass of 44 kilogram, which mostly comes from the batteries. Uh, and, um, and then some ideas of the operating temperature of the different components. So the, the interferometer and the watts linkage, you want to have an ambient temperature of the PSR, while things like the laser or the, uh, the batteries and maybe even the electronics uh, should be at room temperature, for example. So then you have to, of course, create some thermal management to, to take care of that. With a power consumption of 15 watts, um, which might be reduced potentially if people can, uh, you know, work on this part where I think there's a lot of potential to reduce that part of the power consumption. Um, fine. Now, also maybe to point out a, a few differences between the sound check mission and LWA. Soundcheck is just meant to be one seismic station where the sensor remains, or the two horizontal sensors channels remain on lander. Uh, this is a bit, uh, okay, um, uh, a tricky situation because we have to understand really what the lander is doing. Um, then in LWA, we are talking about four seismic stations, but all of them deployed on ground. Displacement sensitivity here, sub picometer per square root of hertz in the decihertz band. For LGBA, it is a sub picometer only at 0.1 hertz, uh, but you, you are getting to sub femtometer at one hertz. And so that is uh, quite challenging. Um, deployment side, any PSR is fine. LGBA, we, are, we, are, we need a PSR which is below 40 Kelvin. That has to do with the fact that we want to cool the payload to four Kelvin to exploit some niobium based um, superconduction. Um, but we are also, uh, we will hear that later, also working, uh, uh, looking into other material options to maybe go away from this uh, 8, 7 Kelvin to, uh, to a higher temperature. And then we, we, maybe we don't have to use a cooler anymore. Um, then, uh, yes, the proof mass material will be niobium for sound check. And we are looking into silicon as well for LGWA. Uh, proof mass temperature already set, uh, ambient PSR temperature, but here cool to 4 Kelvin uh, with LGWA. That's the, at least the baseline. Uh, readout is laser interferometric. For LGWA, it might also be based on squids and superconductor readout. 
Um, these are the sens this is sensitivity goal, so I will uh, quickly go over it. Um, this is essentially this uh, sub femtometer sensitivity at high frequencies, and then uh, here, well, you see actually in this model um, where I'm already taking into account um, the combination of no, this is for one sensor, but you can see it's actually below 10 to the minus 13. But this is the this is the silicon version already of the of the sensor. So minus uh, sub sub 10 0 0.1 picometer per root hertz at, at 0 0.1 hertz. So of course nothing very easy. Uh, we for this we also need a, a demonstration on Earth somehow, and uh, what we are building at LNGS. Uh, is uh, a seismic isolation platform. Uh, this is adopted from the LIGOS uh, active seismic isolation system, small modifications, uh, mostly about the sensors that you deploy inside that platform where we will use uh, some broadband sensors instead because we are more interested in the lower frequencies and in the decibels band. And so we will have uh, three of uh, uh, three broadband sensors inside here and, uh, and uh, otherwise it's quite similar to what people in LIGO know as, as HEM-ISI. Uh, and that will be inside a uh, vacuum system uh, underground. And so you're already profiting from the very quiet underground environment at LNGS. Uh, and then on top of that, you can then really try to, to do uh, your active seismic isolation. And then on this platform, you will deploy two of your lunar seismometers. And then in a, in a comparative measurement, what we call huddle, huddle test, where you essentially cancel each other's uh, seismic signals out, you're, you're trying to uh, see what the actual performance limitation is of your of your sensor. Um, then we will do uh, this already plan in, in the planning as well, uh, lunar analog studies at Mount Etna, where we'll deploy uh, around 10 broadband sensors uh, to uh, study correlations uh, in the decihertz band at Mount Etna. And then we will also inject gravitational wave signals to do the whole processing uh, in simulation at least uh, for, of, of the optimal gravitational wave uh, observations. And there you see, there are always uh, quite a few people around. Uh, let me skip over that. We have seen that. Um, uh, again, something that I want to uh, point out is the, the, um, the, the reach that you have with LGWA. Essentially, you can get to a redshift of 40 for sure. Uh, I mean, not for sure. I mean, this is what uh, based on the sensitivity uh, models that we have at the moment. And so it would perfectly fit in this mass spectrum between ground-based detectors and LISA. And so this is here where you can look at, you know, uh, at IMBH, like intermediate mass black hole binary uh, at the very early universe and connect them maybe to the, the, you know, to the formation history of the massive black holes as well. Um, okay, now this is our plan. Uh, so I, I would say the, the way I'm always talking about this plot is if we got all the funding that we need whenever we ask for it, then this is our timeline. Uh, and so Gemini is already uh, under construction and, uh, you know, we will have it constructed in 2025, I expect, but then we will probably have good uh, use uh, in 2026 with some uh, sensors on the platforms. Soundcheck uh, is, uh, you know, the sensor itself, you know, yours is working on it. Uh, and so that is already under development and he already has uh, years long experience with that. So that is ongoing. Um, we have submitted the ESA soundcheck uh, concurrent design facility proposal, and so we we will uh, we expect some feedback from that uh, soon from ESA. Um, we can do payload assembly and integration, uh, integrate testing, special calculation. This is all planned at GSSI, um, and then this is the timeline towards LGWA. But of course, without any launch dates, because that's not under our control anyway. Um, and then my last slide just in my uh, own interest to tell a little bit about the situation in GSSI. So it is uh, becoming uh, an institution which is very much focused on space uh, technologies and science in the future. So we have uh, with Thales Alenia Space, which is one of the biggest uh, space uh, companies in Europe, we have uh, a collaboration, we have created a foundation where we can now hire um, under non-public constraints. So that means like you, you are not constrained anymore by, by the public uh, uh, um, um, policies uh, and rules. Uh, we can hire engineers and provide services like space qualification. Uh, so that is more a tool. And then there's funding going into it. For example, the Space and Earth Innovation Campus, which is 20 million, uh, where we already bought the building. 
which is a huge, will become new laboratory with uh, clean rooms, uh, all the facilities for space qualification, shake table and all of that. Um, and this will be um, a nearby GSSI, so we can work there. And then we also got funding 10 million into the Advanced Space Technologies and Research Alliance, which is mostly for a satellite um, mission, but some of this also goes into LWA, which I will use uh, for some uh, developments uh, for LWA as well. And so that is the situation. So I think it looks uh, quite good for us and uh, similar situations uh, in, uh, for some of our collaborators in Europe. So yeah, and that's it. Yeah, I want to stop. Any questions? Uh, Ian, so I'm coming back to the conceptual thing. So I'm trying to understand how the whole thing works in the moon. So suppose you take moon as the as a sphere, yes. which under the influence of gravitational waves will do some oscillations. But then as you said, that if the Young's modulus was actually infinity, it would be the best detector. Uh, yes, for the, yes. In some sense, yes. because we, we yes. see in, in yes. so in my understanding in GR, what we are we can measure is the difference distance between two points. Yes, and that so I'm just trying to understand what are those two points here in the sense that suppose Moon was completely rigid and nothing is moving. Were, yeah, so if it were completely rigid, then uh, and you have here your proof mass and your seismometer, then you have one test mass here, which is the Moon, and then you have one test mass up here, which is the suspended mass in the seismometer. And then uh, you would measure a gravitation wave signal, which has the constant uh, baseline, which is 1,700 kilometers. So it is exactly like torsion bar, if you want. So if you monitor the horizontal direction with the seismometer here, then what you are measuring is that kind of response of these two test masses in the tidal field of the gravitation wave. And it's exactly the same that would produce in torsion bars, the gravitation wave signal. So, uh, and that, that is the idea. So, you know, you have to think of the moon essentially in its response to the, to, to the tidal field. You have to think of it as a point mass at this, at this point. Uh, and so you have two point masses at a distance of 1.7 kilometers and they move in the tidal field as we know. And, and so that's the motion that you can read out. The interesting thing is in that case that you just need a local readout. You don't need like, uh, you know, read out both sides. So, so the thing is that is you, if you, if you consider two points, then you have to measure the distance between those two points, which you, yes. which is not exactly what is happening because you are measuring in one point. Because you could go to a frame which is kind of moving. No, no. The, the, the thing is that the whole moon is, of course, you know, because it's rigid. Mm. That location change is transferring equally to the surface. So what you do is you do measure the distance change, but you don't have to measure it with respect to this point. You can measure it with respect to any point of the moon because it moves. All the same because it's infinitely stiff that's our thinking at the moment right so if it's infinitely stiff then you can pick any point inside the moon for your re relative measurement and so measuring with respect to the center is the same as measuring with respect to the surface it's a perfectly rigid body mm. that's our gedanken experiment at the moment so in this uh, scenario uh, uh, measuring locally is the same as if you uh, uh, sh sh uh, had a torsion bar that went all the way to the center of the moon it's the same, uh, the, the same signal that you see. The inner resonant part. Going back to Weber's experiment, mm -hmm. bar is the moon, and the piezos attached to bars are seismometers. Right? Yeah, and yeah, that but not... That, that's not that's not what he because ah. in, in the in the bar detector you would not see any signal if the bar were infinitely stiff. Exactly. So uh, uh, this is not that's anymore so... the the resonant bar scheme that we are talking about. We are talking about the LIGO scheme. So. If this is the moon is infinitely stiff, then the whole situation is LIGO-like, hmm. where you have two test masses and they are, they are in the tidal field. And now the question is, how do you do the measurement between them? And uh, this can be done in a local fashion because the motion of the center of mass translates equally to all points in the, in the moon. Yeah, so this is, this is like, suppose you have suspended mass LIGO-like interferometer. Could you detect gravitational waves by only looking at the motion of one meter? I mean, in, no. in my view, it is almost like coming to that point. So it's yeah, like- but you, no, no, but exactly. So yeah, so the answer to that question is no, you cannot because you have to make a relative measurement, of course. 
between the, the two uh, positions or the distance change between them. Uh, and so um, uh, it must still be a relative measurement, but that's what you realize with your seismometer. It is a relative measurement between the motion of the center of mass of the moon and the motion of the center of mass of your proof mass in the seismometer. So you have your relative measurement. The, the, the strange thing is that, you know, if, the, if one of the LIGO mirrors were so large that it extended four kilometers, then again, the laser would just have to be that short to measure the, you know, if, if the test masses are infinitely stiff. Right. Okay. So another question is related to the, the, the proof of concept, what you are doing. Is it possible to make, let's say, a very rigid, stiff uh, object, like not the moon, but like, let's say, big object, and then you put a seismometer inside and perturb that very stiff object by some normal mode or something like that and see whether you can pick up the signal through the seismometer, because that would be sort of similar to it, I guess, but I don't know whether it, there is a flaw in that. No, I mean, uh, okay, I don't know exactly what you mean, but if you if you if you're thinking about um, you know a much smaller object, but I mean, so the the thing is, the the moon in the in the, uh, the, the if you look at the simulations, the 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 baseline of the moon at zero point one hertz for gravitation, you know, that describes essentially the interaction with gravitation waves. That baseline is around hundred thousand hundred kilometers, so it's very big effectively at, at zero point one hertz. And that has to do also with really the, the details of the internal structure. Now, um, uh, you, don't, you don't get that baseline, you know, because if you wanted to have an infinitely stiff body, it would have to be at least 100 kilometers in diameter. No, no, I don't mean a, a CR detector. I'm saying uh, the... we should uh, postpone the discussion to the discussion okay. session or the offline, because uh, we have already exceeded the time. Yes. And uh, uh, in, uh, that is a one quick question, yes. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, so on slide number 16, you showed the uh, sensitivity curve. And the best sensitivity you could get is of the order of 10 to the minus 14. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. yeah, so this, this, is a, this is the instrument sensitivity. Yeah. And then here is the, you know, the, 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 the background, the station, you know, the, the level, the predicted in, in this paper, this is the only published, you know, this is the best published study at the moment for the background. And that one predicts a, a PSD that is a power spectral density around that value. And so here you would still have to use the array to reduce that impact down to that sensitivity, you know, the instrument noise. Right. So my question is, uh, in one of the other slides, when you did this sound check, uh, when you estimated the sensitivity using sound check, the order of the sensitivity was the best case scenario was 10 to the minus 21. So I wonder why there's ah. a difference, uh, several order of magnitude. So where, what, okay, one second. Yeah. So this is here, this is ground, this, this is really the displacement sensitivity. Right. That means like the sensitivity to surface vibrations. While, uh, okay, the, let's get to another, uh, yeah, you know, here we have strain, which is gravitation wave strain. So then you have to calibrate between the two. Uh, it's, it's, you know, for people who work on the instrument, it's better to uh, uh, not fold in all of this uh, messy stuff with a lunar response. So you are just, uh, it's easier to just look at the sensitivity with respect to surface vibrations. But then, of course, with the lunar response, you translate this into a strain sensitivity, you know, of the gravitation wave strain, and then you get these curves. So that's how these two plots relate. Sure, okay, sure. Uh, we'll go on to the next talk.